You unlock this door with the key of compassion. Beyond it is another world, a world of science, a world of common sense, a world of sanity. You're moving into a land of both empathy and ethics, of nutritional knowledge and empowerment. You've just crossed over into Dr. Osborne's zone. Welcome to Dr. Osborne's zone. Tonight we're covering all things digestive tract. So if you struggle with constipation, diarrhea, indigestion, heartburn, stay tuned. We're going to be talking about some great remedies for you. And before we dive into the content of today's show, make sure you hit that like or subscribe button below and hit the bell to get notifications so you can keep getting our weekly videos. So let's dive in. We're going to talk about first a little bit about digestion fundamentals. So many people gravitate to grabbing a pill, um, you know, an over-the-counter prescription drug from the doctor before they think about these things. So we, before we get into home remedies, let's talk a little bit about GI tract function. Remember in the mouth, this is where we begin the digestive process by secreting digestive enzymes. We've got different glands in the mouth, the submandibular parotid glands secrete amylase, which is an enzyme that helps us begin to break down carbohydrates. We also have teeth. If you've got them, right, they chew the food and that physical mechanical action of chewing starts to break down the food physically. These things happening in the mouth, and as we go through the esophagus down and hit the stomach, we're now releasing acid, and we're releasing proteolytic enzymes. So these are enzymes that break down proteins. So this is where a lot of our protein digestion begins, is specifically in the stomach itself, before things are dumped into the small intestine. Once things are dumped into the small intestine, this is actually where the pancreas comes into play because the pancreas will secrete something called bicarbonate, H2CO3, or bicarbonate, and this neutralizes the acid from the stomach so that the acid from the stomach is not damaging your small intestine and eroding that lining. So the pancreas becomes what we call an accessory organ or an aid to digestion. And once we hit that small intestine, the liver and the gallbladder also kick in with bile. And bile is a salt that helps to emulsify or surround your fat. So how do we digest our fat? We, we have to have enough bile for that to happen. So bile, basically it wraps around vitamins A, D, E, and K, the different types of fats that you eat in your diet like omega-3 and monounsaturated fats, etc and it wraps around them, making them water soluble so that you can absorb them with great efficiency. So if you've got liver or gallbladder problems, a lot of times you know, people go to the GI doctor because they're having digestive issues. They do a scope, they look at the GI tract, but they fail to look at the gallbladder, the liver, or the pancreas. So don't forget about these accessory organs to digestion. It's important to take them into consideration as well. So once we make it through the small intestine, which is where a lot of digestion and extrapolation of vitamins and minerals and absorption of vitamins and minerals occurs, we hit the large intestine. And so that large intestine coming up over and down, the large intestine's job is really is to continue to break down food, but it's really to regulate water. It's a water balancing uh, organ as well. So it helps to regulate, maintain water balance and hydration but also helps to form stools so that we can pass the toxins out, keep the nutrients in. So again, these are just general fundamental things that you should be aware of because most problems for GI tract or digestion disruption begin with what you put in your mouth. And so most people dismiss that part and unfortunately most doctors dismiss that part they'll tell you food doesn't have anything to do with this problem and then they'll want to put you on an antacid or an antibiotic or a steroid or a pain relief medication and and they're not really asking why the gi tract is struggling with symptoms remember what you put in it's the thing you do every day most people three times a day you subject yourself to eating so that you can get nourishment, but if the very foods you're eating are acting like poisons or they're damaging to you, you can, you can take on a host of different types of symptoms regardless. And so don't forget that part. You've got to think about what's going in. Now let's start with some home remedies for digestion 
uh, from an indigestion and heartburn perspective. So there's some, cert- there's some very easy things and free things that you should do if you struggle on this front. And we'll start over here on the right. One of them is intermittent fasting. The gut cells, the GI tract cells are brand new. Every two to seven days you have a brand new lining. And so one of the things that, that people have gotten into the habit of doing, and we, we really we can thank mainstream medicine and nutrition for this, is people are told that they need to eat six small meals a day or they need to eat square balanced meals all day long. Um, and so there's this perception that, that if you're not eating every few hours, you're somehow going to become hypoglycemic and, and, and get sick from that. Um, and that, the reality is, is that humans evolved fasting, right? You've heard the term feast or famine uh, because when food was available, we would eat it. And when it wasn't available, sometimes we'd have to go days before we got food. And so intermittent fasting is a way you can implement a fasting um, strategy in your day-to-day lifestyle that can be very, very beneficial because when you give your gut a break, it's just like exercise. You don't exercise three times a day or six times a day. Your body would start to break down. Your muscles and your joints would be, in, you know, they, they would be in rebellion, so to speak. So you've got to give your digestive tract some time off as well. You need to give it a vacation. And so intermittent fasting can be very, very helpful. These cells heal, heal very quickly. So if you've got heartburn or if you've got acid reflux, remember healing can occur very fast in the GI tract. Think about it. If you've ever gotten a cut or sore in your mouth, how quickly those things heal. It's because these are the same cells. They turn over very, very quickly. So intermittent fasting gives them the capacity to heal because it gives your gut a break. And if there are foods in your diet that you're eating that are responsible for your indigestion or for your heartburn, you're giving them a break. You're giving your gut a break from those foods as well. And this is what allows you to start paying attention to how food might be affecting you when you eat it. So intermittent fasting, I recommend it's easy. Most people can do a 16-8 intermittent fast. That's where you pick an eight-hour window over your course of your day, fit all your meals in that eight-hour window, which for most people is typically an early dinner and a late kind of brunch, if you will, or a very late breakfast. And then there's this eight-hour period in the course of the day where you can fit your meals, but then you have the 16-hour gap where you're not eating and that gives your gut rest. Number two, very free, very common solution is to eat smaller portions. How many times have you been with somebody, whether it be a family member going to a restaurant where, um, where they're, you know, the plate comes out and the servings are massive, right? The servings could feed probably four people, um, and then they eat the whole plate. They clean their plate. And then they're after the dinner, they're like, oh, heartburn, digestion. They're so full and they're so bloated. Eat smaller portions. I mean, we, we've, uh, we've gravitated toward and adapted toward thinking more is better. Um, but in reality, when it comes to food, smaller portions can sometimes make the difference because sometimes it's not the food that you're eating, but it's the quantity that you're eating. You're putting too much in your gut and your gut's not robust or strong enough to handle the quantity you're putting in. So just eating smaller portions can solve it for many people. Another one is bitters. Bitters stimulate digestion. So they stimulate the flow of digestive juices. And a lot of people skip this part because bitters don't taste very good, right? So you think of bitters, you think of like those dark greens in a salad. Um, And again, without them, some people really have a hard time because their guts are not being stimulated. Their digestive juices aren't being stimulated. So bitters can be very helpful for many people. So this is one of the reasons why some people really benefit from that pre-dinner salad, if you will. Now, this is a tip if you struggle in digestion. Also, we can do fermented foods. Um, fermented foods provide bifidobacteria, lactobacillus. Think of these as really more than anything. Think of them as probiotics. And what do these guys do? Probiotics, they actually help with digestion. They actually help us digest and break down our food. It's not just your your stomach and your intestines making acids and enzymes. It's the bacteria that live inside of you, the friendly flora that actually help you break down the foods that you eat. And so fermented foods provide a robust source of probiotics in the diet that can be very, very helpful and supportive of your ability to digest. 
The other is digestive enzymes. Now, this is one that, you know, especially many of you watching the show are gluten sensitive. You've got, you know, decades of damage that were caused by gluten to your GI tract. And so one of the hallmarks of gluten-induced gut damage is a low capacity to produce digestive enzymes. And so a lot of you do really, really well taking an enzyme uh, supplement. Now, one of the questions I commonly get on this one is, if I take a digestive enzyme, will it reduce my body's ability to make digestive enzymes? And the answer there is absolutely not. Taking digestive enzymes will not lower your body's ability to make them. Um, remember, when you eat real food, when you eat whole food, many of your plants and vegetables and fruits have enzymes in them. Think of pineapple, the bromelain, which is a, an enzyme in pineapple, when you eat a really ripe and good pineapple, it almost dissolves in your mouth. That's the enzyme in the pineapple helping you break that food down. So you take natural enzymes from foods that you eat all the time, and those don't inhibit your ability to make enzymes either. So taking digestive supplements um, are not going to wreck your body's ability to make its own enzymes. Now, some other things that you can do. One of the things that we sometimes see, and this isn't true of everyone, but it's, 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 it can be true, especially, again, I'm coming back to people who are new to the gluten-free diet. Their guts are a mess. They're just trying to restore and recapture their health. It's to avoid food combining because carb, fats, and proteins, when you, when you put all those things together, sometimes that can be a little too much for your gut to handle when it's compromised. Okay, if your gut is robust and healthy, this shouldn't be an issue, but many of you don't have robust, healthy guts, so keep this in mind. Um, so don't mix sugars or fruits, right, and meats. Bad idea. Naturally speaking, carbohydrates, if you will, um, generally they come by themselves in the diet. Meat and, uh, I should say, proteins typically come with fat. So if we look at where that, where that comes from, you know, protein generally comes from meat, although you, know, you get some protein from vegetables as well, and there's, but most of your vegetables have a very low amount of carbs and, and, and high, really higher quantities of proteins, and then you have your fruits, which are mostly carbs, and then you have nuts, which are mostly fat, but a little bit of protein, and then you have your meats, which is mostly protein and fat. So um, try keeping and separating out those groups. Some people find that when they, when they sit down for a meal, you know, if they just eat the serving of meat, they do really well. Or if they just eat the salad, they do really well. But when they start trying to combine these different things, it really gives them indigestion or heartburn. So keep that in mind. One of the other things that you might consider doing um, is betaine hydrochloride. Now, betaine hydrochloride is a supplemental acid that you can take orally 10 minutes or so before you eat. And where this can really be helpful is in digestion of protein. Now, one of the things that we see, uh, genetically speaking, is that people with A and AB blood types don't have robust stomach acid production. So think of this as... as um, you know, not a weakness so much as it's just not a strength, right? A's and AB's don't have robust uh, protein digestion capacity, so they generally tend to do better with much less animal protein and much more vegetables. This is actually, in, in my opinion, one of the reasons why we see a, a huge split or dichotomy in the general population, because some people say, look, I went vegetarian and I feel fantastic. It's the best I've ever felt in my life. And others say, I could never go vegetarian. I have to get plenty of meat. I'm one of those. Um, but a lot of times it has to do with genetically with your blood type, and this is actually linked to your capacity, your ability to produce stomach acid. And so when you're a low stomach acid producer, if you put a bunch of protein on the stomach, you're not going to digest it very well, and that protein is going to lock you up. It's going to constipate you, and it's going to create a putrefication process. That protein is basically going to start rotting inside of you because you lack the robustness to break it all down. Now, I'm not saying that type A's and AB's should never eat protein. I'm just simply saying if you are, you might want to consider using an acid supplement if you're going to eat uh, an animal protein at your meal. Um, some people also don't, you know, if they don't want to take an acid supplement, do well with apple cider vinegar or ACV. 
because it's a mild acid. So putting it down before you eat might be very, very helpful to get some acid in that stomach going to help break that food down. Probiotics as well. Now, I mentioned over here fermented foods could be beneficial for the probiotic effect. Well, so can taking oral probiotic supplements. Uh, because again, going back to what I said earlier, probiotics help and aid with digestion. One of the other factors that we see here is people don't get adequate rest. Um, why is that important? Because if you're not sleeping enough, this is going to increase your stress. And ultimately, people that have poor digestion and reflux, are uh, a lot of them are stressed out. And what this does is it drives the sympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system is the fight or flight nervous system. It's the part of your autonomic nervous system that uh, helps you to escape danger. It's when you make a lot of extra adrenaline, noradrenaline, what are called the catecholamines, these uh, hormones that drive the stress response. Well, when we're trying to digest, we don't want to be driving the stress response. We want to be relaxed, right? We want to be calm. And so... Um, if we're not getting enough sleep, we're, you know, we're going to be more stressed out. If we hate our job, we're going to be stressed out. If we're in a bad relationship, we're going to be more stressed out. If we hurt all the time, we're going to be more stressed out. And again, that's going to drive sympathetic, which is the opposite of good digestion. So it's very, very important that you get enough sleep and that you also, you're looking at your stress and monitoring your stress as a whole and making sure that you're doing everything you can to keep it at a, at a normal level, especially before eating time. And then we have exercise. Exercise, movement is so important. Um, so many people develop problems because they're sedentary. When the body's sedentary, the bowels will slow down. It won't move and they won't work as well. Remember when you move, your, your, you know, structurally, physically, when you move, your tailbone which is that, that bone shaped like a triangle at the base of your spine, it moves in a figure eight motion when you walk. And so what happens is there's eight holes in that tailbone that contain nerves from your spinal cord. And these nerves, they have a pumping action um, on your spinal cord that creates the circulation of cerebrospinal fluid. So you know, that's part of something that helps your body detox. But these same nerves also, when you keep them in motion and you make sure they're not being compressed or pinched, um, or the muscles around them aren't shrinking, causing compression of the nerves. Many of these nerves traverse and feed your intestines. And so if you're, if you're inactive, you can actually develop a reduction of nerve energy flowing to the intestines, large and small, leading to a slower function, which leads to indigestion and heartburn. So Again, everything on this list, minus the supplementations you can, the supplements you can do for free. And if you're doing all these things already, you might consider implementing some of these supplements into the course uh, of your, you know, of your problem and see if they're not helpful. Okay, let's talk now. Let's talk about constipation. Let's talk about some home remedies uh, if you're experiencing this. So constipation, you know, generally speaking. We should have one to two healthy, full-formed bowel movements each day. And a lot of people, you know, they're one every other day. That's probably the most common when I see clients in the office. Um, and sometimes it's one a week, right? One a week. And this, you know, this is horrific. Um, there's, a, you know, a lot of doctors are now di diagnosing this condition, IBS type C, that stands for constipation, IBS stands for irritable bowel syndrome. Um, so the reality is this, that when the bowels are constipated, it's typically um, for, for a number of different reasons. But one of the reasons is people are stressed out and they try to eat on the go. Um, you ever been in the car and you're driving through somewhere and you pick something up quick and you're eating while you're working, while you're talking, while you're driving in type traffic? Like that's a mistake. Your body, when you're eating, is designed to be at rest because the part of your nervous system that is activated during eating is called the parasympathetic nervous system. That's the nervous system that tells your body to release digestive enzymes and stomach acid. It's also the part of your nervous system that creates the propulsive movement of your intestine, the peristaltic movement. So that's the muscles as they contract and they push food down through your body. So, you know, from your mouth to your anus, right? Because we want things 
ultimately want, we want to have a healthy toilet time, right? So if we're stressed out before dinner, if we're stressed while we're eating, this is going to be one of the major contributing factors to constipation. So before you sit down to eat, take a minute, uh, turn off the TV, turn off the radio, have a peaceful conversation, something that makes you happy, or do something that makes you happy, but be in a state of good peace. Now, some people find this is, you know, some people find that prayer before dinner gives them a sense of peace before eating. And I think, you know, if you're a spiritual person, you know, that should be right up your alley. Some people also find that breathing, like deep breathing before a meal, uh, is also very calming. And so you can sit down and you can do deep breathing for a couple of minutes, you know, two to three minutes of deep breathing is going to activate your parasympathetic nervous system. And that's going to improve your digestive flow. So it's going to improve your ability um, to turn on the digestive tract, neurologically speaking. Also, when you're sitting down to eat, you know, a lot of people inhale. I remember when I was in the military, uh, when I went, when I was, I was in the Air Force, and so in basic training, yeah, we'd, we'd go to the chow hall, and uh, we had like 10 minutes to eat, and um, you know, I was the last one to get my meal, but I, but I, but I, was, always, but I was also the first one that had to be done uh, when I was in basic uh, because of the role that I played. And anyway, so I was last one in, first one that had to be done, so what they basically made us do is inhale our food. It took me close to a year once I got out of the military to, to slow down and start like functionally chewing my food. But if you don't chew your food well, you're missing a huge part of digestion. Number one, chewing stimulates digestive neurological stimulus to activate the stomach and get the rest of the digestive tract warmed up and ready to go. Chewing also releases saliva that contains enzymes like amylase that helps you start breaking down enzymatically the food that you're eating. But more importantly, chewing is important for the physical breakdown of your food to get it ready for the enzymatic response. So just chewing your food well can make a massive difference uh, in your GI tract. And this is especially true. Now, those of you may, some of you may have a really robust digestion, and this is not that big of a problem for you. But again, a lot of you Coming off of years of gluten-induced GI damage, your guts are not in great shape. And so one of the things that you can do today, right now, is just start chewing your food very thoroughly. Chew it until it's somewhat pasty before you swallow it. And that takes the pressure off of your damaged GI tract to have to do quite so much work. You do the physical chewing action, reduces the enzymatic, uh, the enzymatic process uh, necessary to break the food down completely. Again, we mentioned that, you know, relax before dinner, but also eat in a peaceful environment. Like you shouldn't be having an argument or a fight at the dinner table. That's the wrong time to do that. Um, again, we don't, want, uh, we don't want our sympathetic nervous system activated. We want our parasympathetic nervous system activated. Water is important here. Now, um, it's important to note that when you're eating your meals, ice water is a bad idea. Ice suppresses blood flow right? Cold suppresses blood flow. So if you dump a bunch of ice cold water into your gut, you're basically suppressing the blood flow to the area. Remember, one of the things that happens when we're getting ready to digest is our nervous system diverts more blood to the GI tract on purpose. It's doing it for a reason. Why? We need blood to digest food. We're getting prepared to send the nutrients and the oxygen to the digestive organs to help them do their job. So if you basically, if you ice it, you're reducing blood flow to the area, and that's a bad idea. It can hinder your digestion. So if you're drinking water with dinner, room temperature is best. Now, as a general rule of thumb, too, um, it's not that you need to drink water with the meal. Some people actually don't do as well drinking water with the meal. It's that you need to drink enough water over the course of the day. So this is daily intake. And it's different for different folks, but kind of as a rough estimate, 64 ounces a day for most adults is somewhere in the right neighborhood. Um, and remember this, if you're eating fruits and vegetables, that you know the vast majority of fruits and vegetables are water. So you count that as part of your water. You know, I'm not, when I say 64 ounces, it doesn't mean you have to get out a, a measure and, and rule every cup or measure every cup. But know that if you eat a lot of plant-based foods, you're getting water from the plant-based foods provided, especially raw ones, 
uh, because the less you cook them, the more water they contain. So that's a source of water in the diet for you. So don't forget about that water. Water also helps the bowels move. Water is liquid, right? And so flow is important. So people who are dehydrated oftentimes complain of constipation. We'll see this a lot in athletes as well who sweat profusely when they exercise um, and they become dehydrated. So make sure you, if you are exercising, especially if you're exercising aggressively or if you're a heavy sweater, that you're getting enough water back into your diet to make sure that you have enough liquid to push fluidic uh, propulsion through your bowel. Fiber is also important. Um, you know, there are a number of plant-based fibers that um, basically what they do is they feed a lot of people think fiber is bulk, and so it pushes you know, poop through you, but they feed bacteria. It's one of the main functions of fiber. Um, you know, fiber is oftentimes referred to as a prebiotic. So if you see a supplement that says prebiotic, um, it's generally it's a fiber, right? And so that feeding of the good bacteria, remember what I s said before, the good bacteria, the probiotics, if you will, help you digest your food, but they also produce a substance called butyrate. Uh, and not just butyrate, they also make uh, the family of substances called short chain fatty acids, butyrate being the primary one. And so um, what is butyrate? It is the fuel source for colon cells. So Butyrate deficiencies have been linked to cancer. This is why, you know, a lot of times you'll hear from doctors, make sure you get enough fiber because fiber helps reduce colon cancer. It's because fiber leads to the production of butyrate. Butyrate being the fuel source for your colon cells allows your colon cells to replicate and make new cells. And if they don't have enough fuel, they start to mutate and they can start to form polyps and other type of cancerous lesions. So you want to make sure you're getting enough fiber, you know, for the benefit of the function of the colon. Remember, if the colon cells don't have fuel too, they also are not gonna push your bowel movements very effectively. And so again, it's an important aspect of not being constipated. And we talked before about acid, about betaine hydrochloride, and I also mentioned a ACV, apple cider vinegar, especially in people with blood type A and type AB who make or generally are, are lower stomach acid producers. So if you're eating heavy protein diet or heavy meat diet, you know, this may be something that's extremely supportive. Is where I see a lot of constipation in my own clients is, is not so much um, as a general rule that everybody's constipated. It's, it's very commonly we tie it back to these two things right here, A and AB. These folks are a lot more constipated as a general rule than other folks. And so a lot of times putting them on an acid supplement will help support their digestion of those proteins so they're still getting protein in their diet you know that they need for healing and repair but it's not backing them up quite so much because we're putting acid down in the stomach to help them start to degrade and break that protein down so constipation do these things and uh, you should be in pretty good shape. If you're not, we'll talk, stay with me, we'll talk about some other things, some of the advanced strategies that you can also apply. So let's talk about diarrhea. What can you do? What are some natural remedies if you're struggling with chronic diarrhea? So number one thing you can do, I've seen this be the most effective, so put a big primary by that, is just fasting. Um, and you could do water fasting would be, you know, one of, one of the better types of fasting. Not so much, uh, although intermittent fasting can be helpful. Fasting, we're talking about 24 hours up to three days water fasts. The problem with a fast is you can't do it forever. But a fast, a lot of times diarrhea can be triggered by the food that you're eating. We see this a lot in patients with ulcerative colitis or Crohn's um, where, or, or even celiac disease where it's what they're eating is actually responsible for causing inflammation in the GI tract and the, that the gut and the intelligence of the gut's immune system says, we've got to get this stuff out of here. So what does it do? It hits the dumping mechanism and boom, we're having chronic diarrhea. And, and so again, especially in inflammatory bowel diseases, where food can be a primary driver, a primary trigger. This is one of the reasons why fasting 24 hours, three days, a lot of people will notice a profound difference quite immediately. So if you are, you know, 
chronic diarrhea, if you have one of these diagnoses, you might just try that 24-hour fast. If things start to slow down and you start to feel better, that gives you insight that it's very likely part of your problem is something that you're eating or some things that you're eating. So fasting kind of is, is effective in two ways. One, it can help with this problem. And two, it can help you self-diagnose whether or not food might be playing a role as an irritant in your bowel. One of the other things that can be extremely effective, probably number two, the second on my list really is a probiotic, uh, especially high doses. So when I say high doses, I mean several hundred plus billion colony forming units a day, typically of, of a, a good solid bifido and lactobacillus types uh, of strains of species. These are ones that I've seen be extremely effective in people who, um, who are struggling. We'll see this a lot post antibiotics. So somebody goes, for example, somebody goes on an antibiotic and the hallmark, you know, one of the symptoms associated with antibiotic use, you know, diarrhea starts up, right? One of the reasons why is the antibiotics, what well, they do, they knock out, they don't just knock out the bad guy, they knock out the good guys as well. And so this is where my, and my advice would be as a general rule of thumb, if your doctor's prescribing you an antibiotic, you should always ask, you know, about probiotics concomitantly. Um, and, and so, you know, it, there's no danger in doing that. The, the issue is if you're taking an antibiotic, you don't want to take your probiotic at the same time. So you want to, you know, two to three hours apart from one another is the best way to do that. And that way you're not just taking a probiotic with the antibiotic and the antibiotic is just neutralizing the effect of the probiotic. So, um, but very safe to take together and oftentimes can help to reduce, to reduce that diarrhea. Now, one of the other things that will commonly see medication induced diarrhea would be people that are going through like chemo, cancer treatments. This can damage the, the GI tract cells for a lot of folks, it damages the cells of the gut. And one of the reasons why is its impact on vitamin B12 and folate. And so a lot of times if you're going through chemo and you're really, really struggling to normalize your bowel, talk to your doctor about taking high doses of B12 and folate. And when I say high doses, you know, anywhere from 5,000 to 10,000 micrograms of B12 and with folate, generally it's one to two milligrams um, per day would maybe be some, uh, something that you'd want to do. I'm sorry, one to two grams, not, not milligrams. Let me get that right for you. Um, because a lot of times higher dose B vitamin can help the GI tract. You know, it's, it's, you, know, you need B12 and folate for the cells of the gut to make new DNA to turn over to heal and repair and to make new cells. And that chemo is damaging that capacity. So these two nutrients are very often very, very effective for supporting kind of a balancing of that if you're going through chemo. So again, you've got, you've got antibiotics, you've got chemo, two primary causes, or can be two primary causes of diarrhea. Food can be a primary cause of diarrhea. These two things um, we can combat with nutrition to a certain extent, support with nutrition. Food, very, very easily, we can, you know, we can suspect it. We can use fasting as a tool to help us understand which possible foods may be the trigger. We can also do testing, which we'll talk about uh, here shortly. Now, one of the other common causes of diarrhea, and I've mentioned this a few times, and that's high levels of stress. We'll sometimes see people with very intense levels of stress not be able to hang on to their bowels. In other words, their body's in such a fight or flight mode that the dumping mechanism, the sympathetic nervous system just says, get the food out. We are, right now we're dealing and coping with stress. We can't cope with the stress of digestion. And so sometimes people under extreme high stress also will start to develop diarrhea. So you also want to consider stress as a major cause, potentially, especially if you live that high stress lifestyle. Now remember too that diarrhea is oftentimes can be a bug. Um, when I say a bug, we, we talk about bacteria imbalance, Sometimes it can be fungal, it can also be parasitic. 
Because your body, when you have an overgrowth uh, or an imbalance in microbiota, is one of the mechanisms, again, that your body's so smart, it's trying to get that stuff out of you. So it's, again, it's hitting the dumping mechanism so that you are trying, you know, you're trying to flush it out of you and get rid of it. So if it's a bug, this is one of those things you need to visit with your doc. Testing is available. I mean, most, most GI doctors, in, in my experience, at least after, after their patients come to me, um, I'm surprised how often GI doctors will not test for these things. So this may be something you really have to push for and ask for. Most of them want to do a scope, upper, lower GI, and a scope won't tell you, a scope can tell you, you know, whether you're inflamed. A scope can tell you whether you have a polyp. A scope can tell you if you have, you know, like sometimes it can tell you if you have celiac or Crohn's or ulcerative colitis type damage. But what a scope can't tell you is why. And so it has, it's limited in its capacity to give you an idea of why the problem exists. Uh, it can tell you, you know, what the intestines look like per se, but not why they look that way. And so if you've got a bug, you really got to get specific testing. Now, GI doctors are capable of doing microbiome testing where they can rule out different types of infection. So again, if you've got chronic diarrhea and you don't know why, especially this is especially true if you've um, if you've been on a vacation recently where, where there was, you know, shared food space, where there's the potential for, you know, food poisoning or, or where there's the potential for you to pick up a parasite, third world countries, swimming in lakes and rivers and things of that nature, you know, uh, being around animal feces, you know, you can, you can pick up parasites that way. So, um, again, if that's part of your history, you want to let your doctor know because it may help encourage them to run testing for bacteria, fungus, uh, or parasitic microorganisms that can also be part of the problem. Now, there's some different supplements that a lot of people will take to support gut balance. Um, we have a formula called microbial balance, which is a mixture of a number of different things. Um, berberine has very uh, gut supportive effects. Turmeric can also be very, very helpful and very effective. Um, I like vitamin C. Uh, as a gut balancer, vitamin C has natural antifungal, antiparasitic, and antibacterial properties. So taking it won't hurt you, but it might actually support you through that. But, you know, again, if you suspect a bug, you want to definitely look at getting it treated, getting it identified, and getting it treated. Okay, so let's talk about some special considerations on the, the digestion front. So some of you may not have a gallbladder. If you've had cholecystectomy or gallbladder surgery removal, you know, where you're going to really struggle is fat, fat digestion. And one of the things that we see, I see in my practice is, you know, this usually it's about five years after the surgery, we'll start seeing fat digestion problems and malabsorption and the reason why about five years is that we're talking about fat. Fat generally is very easily stored in the body. So when we talk about fat-soluble vitamins like vitamins A, D, E, and K, um, a lot of times it can take that long for these to start to show up because your body has this storehouse of them that it can tap into. Be, and so, again, that's why it can take about five years. But it doesn't have to. I mean, yeah, I'm generalizing here. But um, without a gallbladder, you run into this, this potential problem. You also run into the problem of omega-3 deficiency. And um, most people already don't eat enough omega-3 in their diets already, so they're already deficient coming into that surgery. And then you do something where you can no longer um, properly secrete bile in a timed fashion into the small intestine to aid in the emulsification of fats and to aid in their digestion absorption. So if you've had your gallbladder removed, you know, my, I would strongly encourage you or urge you to use a bile supplement before you eat. And in this way, I mean, you remember, not having a gallbladder doesn't mean you don't make bile. Your liver's responsible for making bile, but your gallbladder was responsible for secreting that bile into your small intestine and in, in a timed fashion. So like as you're eating, it's secreting to help you digest your food, but that timed fashion is gone because the organ's been removed. So now um, the bile just kind of 
flows, but not really in a concentrated way before a meal. And so some people find that a bile supplement 10 minutes or so before eating, especially a high fat meal, can be a game changer for their digestion. So I'd encourage any of you that have had a gallbladder removal to consider that. We actually have a formula called Lipogest, which is, was designed, I designed it specifically for people that don't have gallbladders so that they would have that digestive support in the absence of, of, um, of, their, of their organ. The other thing that we have is, you know, special consideration is recent antibiotic use. Um, Antibiotics sometimes are necessary. It's like a two-edged sword. They're sometimes very necessary because you may have a major infection that needs to be treated with an antibiotic, but the damage that it can do to your microbiome after it, it, it takes care of the infection. As a matter of fact, I had somebody last week I was talking to that, um, you know, they had a massive infection and they needed treatment. But after they were done with the antibiotic, they had started to develop all types of problems. They were developing neuropathy. They were developing lots of joint pain, joint aches. Um, and this is because when you mess with the microbiome, you can cause leaky gut. You can allow for the penetrance of, uh, when that leak, gut is leaking, the penetrance of, of, of the contents of the GI tract can start leaking into the bloodstream systemically, creating systemic inflammation. Of course, antibiotics are a known trigger for leaky gut as is infection, so that's why I say it's a two-edged sword. So if you've recently had antibiotic use, you always wanna consider bringing in a probiotic supplement. I, and I, my, you know, my encouragement is that you would do it at the same time. So if you're on an antibiotic, begin the probiotic simultaneously. And as I mentioned earlier, you don't wanna take them at the same time. You wanna give you know, a two to three hour gap in between taking one versus taking the other um, so that you can help to support kind of a, a repopulation of good flora into your GI tract to overcome the potential of side effects from the antibiotic. Remember, antibiotics too um, have been shown to accelerate gluten damage. And so one of the questions I sometimes get asked is, you know, I ate gluten my whole life. I turned 60. I started reacting to it. This can be a trigger or an accelerator for gluten reactivity. Um, it's very well documented in the medical research. I've seen it number, a number of times um, in practice. And so, you know, that's why it's so important to support yourself nutritionally after and during uh, using that antibiotic. So, again, if you're on an antibiotic, if you need to be on an antibiotic, um, certainly take it, but get that probiotic in you as well. Now, the other thing I would encourage you is Sometimes you go to your doctor and they just say, here's, a, here's an antibiotic just in case. Like, how many, of that, how many of you have had that happen where you went to your doctor and you didn't have an infection, but he said, here's, I'm gonna write you a prescription for the antibiotic just in case, take it if you need it, right? And so don't do that. Typically that's a bad idea. If, if your doctor wants you to take it, get him to commit to you needing to take it uh, through testing. So, you know, most doctors can do what's called culture and sensitivity testing, where um, if you, they think you have an infection, they can culture the tissue uh, or the sputum or where, you know, depending on where it's located. And from the culture, they can identify the bacteria if it's there. And then from the culture, they can also identify the appropriate, the appropriate antibiotic that would be effective against the bacteria. That, the name of that test is called a culture and sensitivity. In other words, don't just take a broad spectrum hammer and expect that you're not gonna smash things. Um, get, get actual, actual uh, personalized information, ask for culture sensitivity because sometimes you may have an infection but it may not be bacteria, it may be fungal. If your infection is fungal, and you take an antibiotic, guess what happens? You make the fungal infection worse. And, uh, and I see this happen quite a bit too. People come to me after they've been on an antibiotic for whatever reason, their doctor put them on it, and now they have a raging yeast overgrowth that has to be dealt with. So again, these can be life-saving, but they can also be extremely problematic. Don't take them just in case. Get your doctor to do culture sensitivity and really, really, um, help understand whether or not you need it, but don't just take them randomly just in case. 
Another special consideration, again, we've mentioned blood type a number of times, but it's just, again, I'm going I'm to hammer this home. Um, if you have A or AB, you're going to have lower stomach acid, which is going to make it harder to break down protein, animal protein specifically. So you guys might do better on a, on a heavier plant-based diet and a lower protein diet, but using acid supplements or apple cider vinegar could be a game changer for your digestion and for your bowel function and your bowel movement. So again, these were just some special considerations that I think um, many of you should take into account. Now, if you still struggle, if you've done all those things, everything we've talked about, if you've done those, let's talk about some special other considerations that you may want to dive into because these are other things that I have seen be big, um, huge problems for people who are doing what they think is right and that is a lack of information. So tests don't guess, okay? So you can, you know, you may have your digestive problems. You may have constipation, diarrhea, indigestion, heartburn because you're gluten sensitive. Um, it's one of the most common sets of symptoms associated with gluten exposure is gastrointestinal dysfunction. So get tested. If you're gluten sensitive, appropriately change your diet. You can also get tested for other food sensitivities. There are a number of foods of course, remember, what affects the gut is what you put in your mouth. And so you can be reactive to food. And always remember this statement. One man's food is another man's poison. And so, you know, just because everybody else can eat it doesn't necessarily mean that your body does well with it. And so getting testing can help you understand whether or not, uh, whether or not you're, you know, you're reacting to the food itself. Now, if your doctor won't do the tests, go to glutenfreesociety.org. Um, glutenfreesociety.org. Um, you can get gluten tested and you can get food sensitivity testing done. You don't need a doctor's note. They're very simple tests to do. Um, you know, I, I, the reason we even offer it is because so many people came to us and said, our doctors won't do it. Our doctors won't even talk to us about it. So know that you have Gluten Free Society as a resource if you want to do testing. Another thing to consider that research is really um, effectively shining a light on are something called FODMAPs. And FODMAPs are difficult to digest carbohydrates, basically, that can create a lot of irritation and gas and bloating and IBS, where they're most linked to is, is, is IBS. So again, a lot of what we're talking about today. But um, consider a FODMAP, a low FODMAP diet as a potential. Now, the problem with low FODMAP diets as a rule of thumb is that a lot of foods can, are FODMAP foods. And so to eliminate all the FODMAPs um, can be a massive overtaking and it can be super stressful for some people. So um, know this, that generally speaking, not everybody with gastrointestinal problems reacts to all the FODMAPs. Sometimes it's just going on a low FODMAP diet and paying attention. Sometimes it's certain FODMAPs that are bothersome, but not others. And so this is where you just want to pay close attention and consider a FODMAP. Uh, diet as a tool if you're really struggling with IBS type problems. Consider microbial imbalances. I just talked about this a moment ago, but you know if you're if you're really struggling and your diet's dialed in and you're you know you're doing everything right, you could have you know a bacterial abnormality. You could have a fungal overgrowth, and so you get these tested, right? Get testing done. Ask your doctor to run a microbiome analysis and, and look at what's growing inside of you because sometimes it's these bugs, these imbalances that can create a lot of problems for folks. And then the last thing that I would have you consider doing is have your doctor evaluate your pancreatic function and your liver function. Your pancreas does several things, but you know one of its main functions in digestion is it secretes H2CO3, that's bicarbonate. So this is, this is a, it neutralizes acid. And so some people's pancreas is underperforming and they're having reflux and they're having acid type symptoms. Um, you know, check your pancreas. I see it all the time. It's really with people that have a gluten issue, we see pancreatic insufficiency on the regular. Um, when we look at, at their pancreatic function. And so, you know, the other thing you can measure, uh, amylase, lipase, 
and um, amylase lipase and elastase. Sorry, I had to think about that for a minute. Um, these are all enzymes that your pancreas produces and secretes into your small intestine. They help you digest your, your food. And so again, if your pancreas is underperforming, this can cause a lot of digestive disruption. But again, these can be measured. And then liver function. A lot of people today have a fatty liver and their livers are damaged and not functioning properly. And so bile production becomes a problem. And so their bile becomes deficient or sludgy and they form gallstones. And, um, and of course, that's going to impact the way you digest and absorb fats. And so a lot of times with pancreatic and liver dysfunction, people will have, so like if your liver or your gallbladder is malfunctioning, you have right shoulder pain. So if, you're, if your right shoulder in the back is constantly hurting or if you've got pain across the front on the right side, that may be an indicator for you, a referred pain pattern, if you will, that your liver... Um, and gallbladder are, are disruptive or inflamed. And again, one of the most common reasons I see for that is gluten as well. And then pancreatic pain can refer to the mid-back. It can also, pancreatic pain can refer to the front and feel like heartburn as well. So again, these are just things that you can ask your doctor to measure. You can also ask your doctor to perform an ultrasound. Sometimes an ultrasound can be diagnostic of fatty liver and it can be diagnostic of pancreatic inflammation. So these are non-invasive tests. And these others up here are just simple blood tests that can be run. So again, you've got an array of things that you can talk with your doctor about to get tested. If you've done diet and you've done lifestyle and you feel like you've got everything dialed in but you're still struggling with digestive problems, you know, that's when it's time to move away from home remedies and move into the realm of getting help, right? So those are just some of the more common things that you can get measured to see if there's a better solution for you. Welcome to the Answer Zone. Your questions, my answers. Uh, please don't consider any of this medical advice, but we're trying to give you some guidance and some places where you can begin to have meaningful conversations with your doc. So let's dive right in. Martina asks, for how long after accidentally ingesting gluten does the body produce antibodies? Simple answer, two to three months. Um, the, the research on this, uh, points closer to that two-month mark than that three-month mark. And this is why you'll commonly hear me say that, um, that gluten the size of a breadcrumb can cause inflammation for up to two months. Now, what I'll do is I'll put a link below this where you can go read about the scientific breakdown of how the body reacts to gluten and how long gluten can stay with you and how long you can produce antibodies. So thanks for writing in with your question. This next one from Penelope, I continually have sore feet, including neuropathy and arthritis in my toes, plantar fasciitis, uh, low back pain and hip pain. I'm stiff and sore 24 seven. I do foam rolling for fascia release. I don't know what to do next, help please. Now, Penelope, of course, you're already following the no grain, no pain diet. And so you're, if you're still struggling, the number one thing that you can do if you're still having chronic pain is to get your nutritional levels tested. A lot, especially with neuropathy, a lot of neuropathies are persistent B vitamin deficiencies. And so it could be B12, it could be B5 or folate or vitamin B1 deficiency that's contributing to that. And so you'd wanna get those levels measured. Now, also part two to that would be to get food sensitivity testing done. You might be reacting to some of the other foods. So if you've cut grain out and you're following the no grain, no pain diet, and you're still struggling, there could be some key foods you're continuing to eat that are playing a role as a trigger to your persistent pain. Christina wants to know, what changes can we do to improve an autoimmune disease if you're on a low budget? So, great question. Look, if you, if you wanna try to conquer autoimmune disease, number one, read No Grain, No Pain. All right, I wrote this book to help people navigate through recovering from autoimmunity using diet and lifestyle. And it's an extremely, extremely effective method. Um, so let's talk about, so beyond the book, right? Because the book you can go pick up at Amazon, you know, eight or nine bucks. 
Um, you can even, if, you, if you're really on a low budget, you can go to your library and you can check it out. But I'm gonna give you seven things that you can do right now for free. Number one, eat only real food. So regardless of food allergy, regardless of gluten or not, um, real food would be the thing that you want to eat. So no processed packaged food. Number two, go to bed. Be asleep between the hours of 10 p.m. and 2 a.m., preferably longer on both sides, but you need sleep to heal and repair. Number three, move your body every day. Depending on what level of disease you have, what level of pain you have, remember exercises to tolerance, but you gotta move your body. It needs movement to heal and repair. Number four, fresh air, go outside, get sunshine. And that's number five is sunshine. So you need clean air and you need sunshine to heal and repair. So number six is drink plenty of fresh, clean water. Your body is 60 to 70% water. And if you're not drinking adequate amounts, your detoxification process will slow down. It'll make it harder to heal. And then the last, number seven, is you need to make sure that you surround yourself with positive influences, people who love you, uh, and, and check your relationships. Because a lot of time, people are surrounded by grief. They're surrounded by, um, they're surrounded by negativity, and that type of energy can really, really delay the healing process. So do those seven things. None of them cost you any money that you're not already spending, and you might just see your autoimmunity start to turn around. So TV shows, that's a, that's a tough one. I, I, I do like some shows, but the problem I've had here recently, maybe some of you could chime in as well and share your experience, but um, a lot of these uh, streaming platforms have really pushed what I would call an, an anti-agenda down our throats. Like it's really, really hard to watch movies that don't um, just push propaganda, whether it's political propaganda. Like when I'm watching TV, I don't want politics. I don't want uh, the flavor of the day being, you know, pushed or forced down my throat or my family's throat. And so I, when I watch TV, I just want to watch a good show with a good story, probably like many of you. And so I've had a really hard time of late finding really good stories. But one show that I have found uh, that I'm really enjoying, it, it's a series and it's a, several seasons, is called Yellowstone, if those of you are familiar with it. Kevin Costner. Uh, does a fantastic job of, of creating a, a kind of a backdrop and a, and a realism of, of, uh, of ranching. And I think it's important that people recognize uh, ranchers as, uh, as important folks and people with important jobs in this country. They bring us the meat that so many of us need to sustain our health at, at great cost uh, and at great hard work for themselves. And so this show kind of illustrates a lot of that, but it also weaves in a, a great storyline. When you know, One of the things I like to see is I like to see good triumph over evil. And sometimes it's, um, uh, it, it's shades of gray, so you don't, it's not necessarily somebody who's a prince or good and, and stands for all good things because nobody is perfect. Um, and this show does a really good job of, of giving you People that are good at heart that maybe do bad things, but uh, they're against really, really bad people who do all bad things. And so it's good to see good triumph over evil. I think that's what's been missing from a lot of TV and a lot of movies probably in the past decade. And this, this series does a fantastic job of capturing it. Hey, thanks for tuning in to Dr. Osborne's Zone. Make sure you join us every Tuesday at 6 p.m. Central Standard Time. And don't forget to hit like and that subscribe button below. Once you hit subscribe, hit the bell so we can send you reminders when we go live to answer your questions and cover all your nutritional information every week.